Our readings this morning come from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I say, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. Their consistency is like the flower of the field. The grass, wither, the grass withers and the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are the grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. Get you up on a high mountain, O Zion. Herald the good news. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald the good news. Lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. And chapter 61, verses 1 to 11. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort those who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the faint spirit, they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up upon the ancient ruins and they shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines but you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations and in the riches you shall glory. Because their shame was double and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot, therefore in the land they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice and I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offering among the peoples. All who see shall acknowledge that they are people whom God has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and the bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and peace to spring up before all the nations. May God bless to our understanding these words of scripture.
Peace upon earth is the prayer we offer. Peace that was promised when Jesus was born. Peace to all men. Peace once again to this war-wearied, war-worried world this morn. It's the opening verse of a medical mission sister song from 50 some years ago now. They have an album called Gold, Incense, and Myrrh. How do we talk about peace in this world at this time? Which really is a question which could have been asked countless other times in countless other situations over the centuries. How do we talk about peace in a world where peace seems so far away? How do we celebrate the coming, the birth of the Prince of Peace laid in a manger in Bethlehem in a city which is in a war zone and has been on and off for 65 years? What's peace mean? There's a picture which was going around earlier this week of a nativity scene at one of the Lutheran churches in Bethlehem. And what they've done is they've gathered a pile of rubble, broken bricks, cinder blocks, and the infant child is lying on the rubble. Where do we find peace in a world which is falling apart at the seams? Again, not a new question. Every generation asks it at least once. But where do we find peace in a world that's falling apart? There are some. I'm going to head over to the, the, Chris, the wreath for a moment, Brenda. It's always nice to let the tech people know what you're doing. There are some who are suggesting that this week, there was something wrong with lighting the candle of peace. And that we should just read the liturgy, but leave the light extinguished. Because peace was so far from reality this year. I, on the other hand, would suggest that in a world that's falling apart, in a world where our news feeds are not peaceful, What light do we need more? Than the light of peace. The light which John tells us shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. If we only lit one candle this Advent season, I think it's the one we need to light is the candle of peace. Of course, peace is related to hope, which is related to love, which is related to joy. They all tie in together. I mean, there's reason we got four of them. I'm going to head back over here now, Brian. What does it mean to light that candle? To share our possibility of peace in the world today? Those ancient words from the book of Isaiah might help us find a way. There's a reason we read these ancient stories over and over again in our worship. Because we believe that the God who is at work in the ancient stories is the God who is at work in the present day. Isaiah 40 is written to people, is spoken to people who are in exile, whose world has been shattered. It's from the era of exile where we get the psalm, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They don't know if God is still with them. They wonder if God will be with them again. They'll wonder if their lives will get put back together, if they can go home. And the word of God comes to a prophet who says, Comfort, O oh comfort ye my people. Say unto them that their time of trial is over. They've done their time. They've served their sentence. It's time to go home. 
and to ensure that I will build a highway through the wilderness. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low. Sideline. My first year in Atacokan, I had chosen to go with the stories of John the Baptist, who in Mark's gospel proclaims himself to be the one who calls out in the wilderness. There's a hymn. There's a voice in the wilderness crying, which has as one of its verses that image of making flat a highway in the desert. And one of the choir members that year was, had very strong environmental sensibilities and read that verse and said, what? But God says to the people in exile, you're going to go home and I'm going to make the way possible. Where there's something which seems too high to get over, I'll flatten where there's something in your life which seems to take you so low you can't get back out, I'll lift you up. Where the going is just too hard, you can't scramble all over all those rocks and obstacles, I'll flatten them out. I'll make it even. God comes to us in our moments of great trial, our moments where our worlds have been shattered and says, take comfort. You're not alone you can come home again. There's peace there. There's peace within our souls when we're reminded that we're not alone. There's peace within our world when we're reminded that change is possible, that a new world can be built, that God's on this great earth-moving can campaign. The God who creates and recreates is at work. Now, the people got home. Well, some of them. Some of them stayed behind. They got home, and they hoped, they planned, they wondered, they, their expectation was, when we get home, all will be well again. And they get home, and Jerusalem is a pile of rubble. And strangely enough, just walking through the rubble doesn't cause buildings to spring up, doesn't cause the temple to be reestablished immediately. The walls are still down. That's disappointing. After our times of trial, when we're told we can go home, when we're told of comfort, we want things to be back the way they were. Surely that's the path to peace, right? Everything back the way it was when everything was good. I'm not sure which generation that was, but when everything was good and all was well with the world. And so the end of Isaiah is words spoken to people who have returned and are frustrated and are downheartened, disheartened. It's words saying, God's still here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. I don't think it's an accident that in Luke's gospel, the first thing Jesus does in public ministry, when he's in synagogue in his hometown, is he picks up the scroll of Isaiah and he reads those words. The Prince of Peace begins his ministry by proclaiming the coming of justice, the returning of the way things should be. Renewal. Because that's the way we get to peace in the long run. We get there, we start with being comforted. We start with being reminded that things can be better. But we only get to true, lasting peace which the world seldom sees. The Romans said they'd found world lasting peace, but like every other empire, before and since, their version of peace was, we've got those troublesome peoples put down for now. And if they start getting troublesome again, well, we'll just go in there with a heavy hand. Romans did it. The British did it. The Americans do it. But lasting peace comes from heeding the words of Isaiah 60 and 61. 
In Isaiah 61, we read about the time when all will get what they need to live. It takes that image of the highway being built through the wilderness and makes it real. Not just bulldozers and earth movers, but changing hearts and minds, changing the world so that the oppressed can go free, so that the blind can see, to proclaim the year of God's favor when all is indeed made right with the world. That's how we get to peace. And that's what starts there. Well, it doesn't start there. God's been working on it for a long time. But God gets frustrated. And God tries many different prophets. And the people still don't get it. So God tries another way. God will walk among us. And remind us what the path to peace is. Remind us of the hope for justice. Remind us of the promise of the kingdom in word and in deed. We still haven't quite got it right. We've been working at it for another couple of millennia, and we still haven't quite got it right. But God hasn't given up. God is still making flat the highway, knocking down the obstacles, pushing the stuff out of the way to help us get there. God still promises that day of God's favor When the oppressed go free, when the blind can see. I found this poem by Helen Radford. And it was posted in 2010, but like many of these things, it's one of those, the lyrics, the the word spoke to me today in this world, in this shattered vision of warfare in Ukraine, bombing in Gaza, Shootings in West Bank. It's a poem of hope, of promise. It's called Rebirth. There seems to be a global awakening. There seems to be a spiritual rebirth. The truth seems at last to be in the reach of us creatures now roaming the earth. There is a flower of faith in the making, and it moves to the source of the light. We breathe hope as the whispering winds of change as we battle to pull through the fight. This is a time of transition, from the old to the wholesome and new. It's time to lay down our weapons of pain, to cease firing our bullets of hate. It's a time to stop singing our anthems of war and stand united before it's too late. Stand in silence and listen to the voice of your soul. It is trying to make itself heard. You might be surprised by the message it brings, by the wisdom it speaks in its words. For the truth lies within, not around us. It's not found in the wealth or the fame. It resides in our heart and our spirit. It is found in the love that we give. In each one of us is a wellspring of faith. Find it now. It is then you will live. God is at work reshaping, rebuilding, renewing the world. That's our hope. That's our promise. It's the path which leads us to peace. God invites us along the way to be ourselves renewed, rebuilt, reformed. To stop firing our bullets. I love that line. To stop firing our bullets of hate. To stop singing our anthems of war as we prepare for the coming of the Prince of Peace, may we pledge ourselves anew to be people of peace, peace in our own souls, peace in our communities, and work for peace everywhere we go. We're being reborn. The world's being reborn. Thanks be to God, who's midwife, gynecologist, who leads us to birth. Amen.